Good afternoon, everybody, and you are very welcome to this curator's introductory talk with Mary Lynch uh, on on Turglina, our new exhibition on Turglina Artists and the Collective. My name is Joanne Drum, and I'm with the Education Department here at the National Gallery of Ireland. This is a uh, short talk, and it will be recorded and made available on our uh, gallery's YouTube page in a few days' time. So, if um, you'd like to tell anybody that you've enjoyed it, they'll be able to watch it as well. Um, thank you for joining us live, those of you who are. This is a webinar format, so we can't see you and we can't hear you. Uh, if you do have questions, we'd love to hear them. I'll be popping up at the end of Mary's talk to relay them to her. Um, you can please put the questions in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen if you if you wave your mouse over it. You'll also notice there's a chat box in uh, Zoom. If I could ask you not to use that, I'd appreciate it. It's because if you ask a question in the chat box, it pops up in front of the speaker as they're speaking and can be quite distracting where, where the Q&A box happens in the background. Um, so that's very straightforward from me. Mary is the uh, fellow, um, sorry, the research fellow in the Centre for the Study of Irish Art and has curated this exhibition, which is in a space that the Centre for the Study of Irish Art are able to use to showcase their um, myriad collections, uh, which are often very rarely um, allowed to be shown, especially because some of them are sensitive to light and there's just so many of them. So I know you're going to tell us more about that, Mary. The exhibition has just opened and it will be there until the 12th of January, but because of the sensitivity to light of some of the pieces in there, I know that you'll be changing that display. So there's possibly three iterations of the same show uh, during the run of it, which is exciting and it means it, it's refreshing for us as well. So what I'll do now, Mary, you're so welcome. I'm going to disappear. Um, Lisa and yourself will stay on screen and I'll pop up later when you're finished. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Joanne. I'm going to share my screen now in one second. Now, um, so uh, this exhibition, I'm delighted to be speaking about on Tori Glenna Artists in the Collective today. This exhibition is the very first exhibition dedicated to this pioneering uh, Irish stained glass studio founded in 1903. Um, and the exhibition really focuses on uh, the artistic innovations and the collective um, achievements of the studio uh, through an investigation of on Tori Glenna's history, archives and artworks. Um, now, most of Antoi Glenna's stained glass is, of course, uh, still in situ in churches around Ireland and further afield. Um, so this exhibition really focuses, it delves into the artistic processes, the um, creative and business decisions behind these extraordinary stained glass uh, designs, which still today you can find in every county in Ireland. Um, so as Joanne mentioned, this exhibition is running until next January. Um, and it's almost like three exhibitions in one, if you like, because um, our works on paper uh, is will be switched out across three different rotations. Um, so uh, repeat visits are recommended uh, so that you can see more of these collections. The reason we do this uh, with our library and archives exhibitions is we want to showcase as much of the collections as possible. Um, um, we want to showcase as much of the collections as possible, uh, but also, as Joanne mentioned, uh, we really want to protect the works on paper as well. So there's kind of a dual, um, a dual um, benefit to our uh, rotations in Room 11 exhibitions. Um, so uh, I'm going to begin by just uh, explaining, I suppose, the title or the name of an on Tor Glenna the studio. Of course, um, it's the Irish for the Tower of Glass. And it has its origins in quite a kind of uh, obscure story, this ancient Irish mythology from the 11th century Book of Invasions or Narra Gawala Erin. Um, and this uh, was an, it was a, a collection of stories based on oral traditions, poetry and prose that uh, recorded or recounted the, um, the uh, successive groups of I suppose settlers or different people that arrived uh, to Ireland across thousands of years. And one of the groups were like the pagan gods, the two Adanin. But the last group to arrive were known as the Milesians. And they were in Ireland for a year when they noticed a glass tower in the middle of the sea. And they immediately wanted to capture this glass tower. So they set out um, every last one of them in all of their uh, all of their uh, boats to capture the tower. Um, but they were unsuccessful. Um, and um, as it happened, uh, 
all of the ships were shipwrecked um, apart from apart from one. And the story goes that um, this surviving these survivors are the ancestors of all Irish people today. So it's quite a, an obscure story, and um, I don't think. Uh, most people would have known the background of Antori Glenna's name, but it, it still kind of conveyed this sense of the kind of cultural revivalism of the period, the romantic nationalism of uh, the Celtic revival of that time. Um, so Antori Glenna had its origins in uh, two uh, key, um, I suppose, developments. Uh, the first was the establishment of stained glass lessons at the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art in 1901. And the other was the construction of Lockray Cathedral in Galway uh, between 1897 and 1902. And the construction of the Galway Cathedral in particular uh, represented an opportunity to, um, in terms of the decoration of this cathedral, to support Irish artists. Because um, in the wake of Catholic emancipation, there was a huge kind of uh, amount of churches being built in Ireland. But Irish churches continued throughout the 19th century, continued to rely on foreign um, imports of stained glass to decorate their churches, um, mostly buying stained glass from Germany or uh, Britain. And um, these kind of uh, these this stained glass is coming from large manufacturers, large commercial enterprises. They weren't really um, there weren't really there wasn't a lot of artistry there. It was often poor quality materials or craftsmanship, quite derivative designs. Um, so there's no kind of sense of the site, the architecture and um, the lighting of the particular site in which the stained glass is going to be um, installed. So uh, Sarah Purser recognized an opportunity here. And so she uh, established on Tour Glenna um, with the help of the Irish cultural activist Edward Martin and the English stained glass artist A.E. Child. And there was a dual goal here to produce high quality Irish stained glass for Irish churches and also to, um, to support local artists in Ireland with employment and training opportunities. Um, so, uh, Antwerp Glenna was um, founded at the, at the height of the Celtic revival. And um, this was a sort of an Irish cultural renaissance. It um, had its origins in the kind of Protestant middle classes in the 19th, late 19th century. And three key kind of goals emerged uh, for the Celtic revival. Uh, the first was the rediscovery of ancient Irish heritage. So there was great um, fascination with Ireland's ancient past, um, monastic sites, Book of Kells, the Arda Chalice, these kinds of um, sources um, from art from the Celtic or ancient Irish past, monastic early Christian past. Um, there was also a move towards asserting national self-reliance so um, that Ireland could demonstrate uh, that it was self-sufficient, could produce its own culture and industry. Um, and of course, the establishment of a distinctly Irish cultural identity. Again, that Ireland was different um, than Britain and it had its own cultural identity. And a lot of these uh, preoccupations are um, evident in this advertisement you see on the right from our um, Antwerpian archive, um, which uh, uh, shows, uh, there's a few interesting things to note about this um, advertisement. Um, it was quite, uh, Sarah Purser quite famously carried these advertisements around with her. And if she was traveling by train, she would always choose a carriage where there was a member of the clergy and she would uh, choose that carriage and give him one of these flyers and really try and convince him to, um, to commission Irish stained glass for his church. Uh, you'll notice as well that Sarah Purser's name is bigger than Untoward Lina's name. Uh, this is an advertisement from probably around 1906. And I suppose Purser had a strong, I suppose, personal brand. Um, so uh, the studio was very much aligning with her as the founder of Anthor Glenna. You'll notice as well the Dainta in Erin or Made in Ireland stamp, uh, which was designed by a corkman, William Buckley. Um, and the artist sometimes painted this logo onto their, onto their stained glass windows, um, along with maybe a signature, kind of a little miniature tower. Um, the flyer also claims that Antwerp Glenna were the only firm um, using Irish made glass. And this is maybe an exaggeration or creative marketing because 
um, the only Irish glass, the only glass that was being produced in Ireland at this time was bottle glass, this kind of green, brown or kind of dull white coloured glass. So the rich, colourful glass that you see on Torglen's windows, uh, they were made from these large sheets of coloured glass that were imported in from England. Um, so um, when we talk about on Torglen, the influence of the Celtic revival, we can see that the artists, um, they really uh, deliberately were producing these uh, innovative designs inspired by um, Ireland's uh, ancient uh, heritage in terms of uh, metalwork, illumination, uh, sculpture, um, looking at early Christian art from Ireland's monastic past. So um, you can see this, for example, in the kind of uh, Celtic ornament on Katie O'Brien's design on the left which is drawing from that kind of insular art that you see, you know, the Book of Kells. Um, and you can often see these details in the background of their um, designs, as you can see with Hubert McGoldrick's design as well. Um, they were also perhaps uh, on occasion bringing in details like, the, again, the Arda Chalice, they might use that um, kind of design or the High Cross or, um, you know, a tower brooch um, and often would also use kind of Celtic letter forms um, in any inscriptions on their uh, on their windows. Um, but it's worth noting that um, at this time, other firms were also um, using Celtic ornament in their designs. And even foreign firms were, you know, they, mayors of Munich were bringing in kind of little bits of Celtic uh, strap work in the background of the designs for Irish churches because the demand was there and they were able to respond to that demand. So you do sometimes see this kind of superficial Celtic um, ornament on stained glass in Ireland. With Antor Glenna, I really feel there was a sense of authenticity in their designs. Um, you get a sense of, you know, the individual treatment of the figures, the kind of um, expressive quality of their designs. Um, and also kind of, a, I suppose, uh, a narrative quality as well, particularly in their, um, in their depictions of Irish saints. Of course, in Ireland, we have a wonderful tradition of lots of different uh, saints um, from our kind of monastic past and they all have uh, lots of unusual kind of traditions associated with them and miracles associated with them which um, are often rooted in like kind of pagan folklore even as well so um, some really nice examples here we have Wilhelmina Geddes, uh, St. Brendan uh, design on the left. And um, I think there's such a forceful expression to um, her imposing saint here. He's almost, he's barely contained within the confines of the composition. Um, uh, what's really interesting about this um, particular design, apart from, I suppose, the individual kind of brooding expression of the saint, which I really love, um, it was designed for the British Empire exhibition in Wembley in um, 1924. So this exhibition was obviously um, all about the British uh, power, prestige, colonization um, of the British Empire. And Geddes has selected a very Irish subject matter, um, an Irish sixth century saint who traveled across the Atlantic and performed miracles in faraway lands long before uh, the British Empire had come into, uh, come into existence. Uh, so it's quite an interesting choice of subject matter. Um, also very interesting on the right, we have Michael Healy's design for um, the Sacred Heart Church in Donnybrook. Um, he has St. Patrick baptizing Saints, Eth Saints Ethna and Fidelma with St. Patrick lighting the Paschal fire in the tracery. Um, so again, we have this narrative here where uh, the, um, the St. Patrick is, um, he is baptizing the pagan daughters of King Lyra. Um, and uh, the, these two princesses, pagan princesses, um, it didn't end well for them, in fact, because you'll see uh, above the two women are two doves, and these two doves represent the departing souls of the princesses, because unfortunately, as soon as they received the Eucharist, they immediately died. So it didn't quite end well for them. But again, a really interesting kind of uh, background of St. Patrick's um, activity in Ireland. Um, these are just some uh, really interesting designs by um, Anthorgan artist Ethel Rind. Um, I don't think they were ever executed. Um, 
but they're nonetheless really interesting. So uh, on the left, we have St. Bridget drawing her clothes in a miraculous beam of light, which is quite a self-explanatory and very useful um, miracle to have in your back pocket. The one on the right um, required a little bit more digging to figure out what was going on. It's simply entitled St. Bridget Performing a Miracle. And so the story is that there was a religious recluse living on um, an island in Ireland. And uh, this man arrived with his family and his child. And he wanted to, he, he claimed that he owned some of this land or he laid claim to some land on this island. And this was pretty inconvenient for the religious recluse. So he went to St. Bridget for her help. And the next thing that happened was a um, this huge eagle came along and snatched the man's baby, which was really alarming for everyone involved, particularly the mother who was very upset. Um, but St. Bridget comforted her and said, don't worry, this baby is uh, going to arrive back on the beach now down below. And that's exactly what happened. There were, there, there were no babies harmed in the making of this particular miracle. So um, uh, there were a few other instances like this that were uh, quite disruptive um, for the outsider and he uh, eventually decided to leave the island, leave the religious recluse alone and leave with his family. Um, so with these kind of designs, we definitely get a sense of a sort of a depth and breadth of research and knowledge here um, of uh, Ireland's history, Ireland's uh, past, um, that's very evident in the of designs. Um, there were other sources of inspiration for Antoiglina, particularly uh, European medieval stained glass. So there is no, there are only fragments remaining. There is no intact um, stained glass um, windows remaining in Ireland. So um, Sarah Purser actually funded research trips to England and France for the artists of Antoiglina. Um, and so we can see in the Antorgan archive examples of postcards, souvenir postcards um, from Saint Chapelle, from excuse me, um, from Canterbury Cathedral, um, from Chartres uh, Cathedral in France. So um, these are all kind of sources of inspiration. And the artists also um, made copies or studies of these medieval uh, windows. Uh, particularly um, medieval English windows, Catherine O'Brien made a lot of studies of um, different um, examples from medieval churches in, in uh, England. Uh, so uh, one here, a study of um, 14th century stained glass tracery of the Christ Church Cathedral in Oxford. Um, a major source of inspiration for Antoine Glenna was uh, the English arts and crafts movement. So whereas the Celtic revival was kind of a very obvious and something that they kind of uh, proudly declared, the English arts and crafts movement was also um, a really important source of inspiration for the studio. Sarah Purser actually initially got in touch with um, Christopher Wall, um, who was the um, he was the father of the English stained glass revival, and she wanted him to come to Ireland and establish a studio in Ireland. But Christopher Wall was far too well established um, in England. He wasn't going to move to Ireland. So instead, he sent over his um, former pupil and his studio assistant, A.E. Child. And so A.E. Child began teaching stained glass at the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art. And then in 1903, he was the manager of Anthor Glenna. And we get a, we do get a sense that um, his mentor, Christopher Wall, was very involved in the early years of Antorglina. So in their cash books, there are kind of little clues to this. And um, you can see um, this cash book uh, showing entries from May 1903, just a few months after the studio was established. And there's a note there about halfway down where it says, carriage of cartoons from Mr. Wall. So um, A. E. Child and Christopher Wall were sending kind of designs and cartoons back and forth between them. So there was obviously a strong kind of consultation going on there, um, particularly in the early days of the studio. Um, so uh, A. E. Child, um, he, he didn't really deviate much from uh, the arts and crafts aesthetic that he learned from Christopher Wall from his mentor. Um, so throughout his career, he continued working and teaching at this method. Um, and we have um, a really um, great example of the arts and crafts style in the stained glass panel on the right. 
uh, of St. Nicholas, and this is one of the stained glass um, panels, which is in the exhibition. Um, so there's a few kind of uh, particular things to note in terms of the arts and crafts um, uh, practice. We can see, for example, the pre-Raphaelite treatment of the figure. You can see there's a lot, there's this abundance of um, kind of pearlescent white glass interspersed then with these bright jewel-like um, small pieces of glass, particularly along the borders. Um, a really recurring motif in A. E. Child's practice and um, in the wider kind of English arts and crafts uh, stained glass um, style is the uh, leafy canopy that frames the figure. Um, so Christopher Wall would instruct his students to study um, to make observational sketches of honeysuckle, oak, um, ivy leaves, and um, encourage them to kind of use this um, as inspiration for creating these wonderful kind of organic, sinuous, leafy canopies that are still quite symmetrical as well. Um, and these replaced the more conventional Gothic architectural canopies that you might see, uh, that you would see frequently in 19th century stained glass. So, English Rights and Crafts movement, extremely important for Antwerp They really embraced the uh, philosophies as well of John Ruskin, William Morris, um, which emphasized, you know, the, uh, the a rejection of the division of labor in favor of the individual artist being responsible for all stages in the design and creation of the window. And this resulted in a wonderfully rich individuality in terms of this uh, the designs of the different artists that emerged in the studio. So the artists were able to essentially express their individualism um, at the studio. Oh, before we move on, yes, uh, this is just an example of how the artists synthesized different sources of inspiration. So you have the rich colors of, you know, medieval European stained glass. You've got the kind of white background, background and the kind of half canopy of leafy bows there framing each of the three uh, saints. And then you have the Celtic treatment of the inscriptions for the three saints. And you'll also notice um, the kind of high cross motif that frames each of the three uh, saints as well. In the background, it's a little bit more subtle. Um, alongside the individuality of the artists, there were um, there were uh, an important aspect of the studio was the collective model of the studio. It, it functioned as a cooperative from the very beginning. Um, uh, even uh, though it wasn't actually um, formally incorporated as a corporate society until 1925, um, the, uh, the, from the very beginning, the artists were sharing access to a uh, kiln workshop materials. So there was that kind of collective model. Um, and this, of course, is against the backdrop of the uh, Horace Plunkett's um, cooperative movement. Um, and many of the early supporters of Antor Glenna um, people like Bishop Healy of Lockray Cathedral, T.P. Gill, who established the lessons in stained glass at the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art, they were all committed supporters of Horace Plunkett's cooperative movement. And George Russell was one of the, um, he was kind of Horace Plunkett's right-hand man in this movement as well, but he was one of the uh, original shareholders in 1925. And according to the minutes of the uh, a studio, um, he gave some useful advice and wished the society every success. Um, but of course, the, the um, oh, and we have this letter as well from the National Library of Ireland where Horace Plunkett writes to Sarah Purser in 1930, next time I go to Ireland, I must certainly look you up and get cheered by hearing the progress of your fine work. It's possible. Now, he, he doesn't mention it to Glenna, but um, it's unlikely that he's talking about her investments in Guinness or her work as a society portrait painter. It's much more likely that he's uh, talking about her uh, formation of this cooperative studio. But of course, the uh, Irish cooperative movement was very much focused on agricultural rural cooperatives rather than workers' co-ops. So um, I would say that the, actually the, the chief source of inspiration for Montour Glenet was um, an English workshop called Lens and Drury. Um, and Lowndes and Drury was established in 1897 by um, an English suffragist and stained glass artist called Mary Lowndes and a craftsman called Alfred Drury. And um, Lowndes and Drury, um, they uh, employed a team of craftspeople 
and um, they offered freelance artists access to studio workshop materials. So they rented studio space essentially to the artists. So it was slightly different from Antor Dinner because Antor Dinner, of course, um, it employed both artists and craftsmen to carry out the, the studio commissions. Uh, so they were slightly different, but they both offered kind of a collective approach um, that allowed artists to overcome the many obstacles to a career in stained glass because obviously the equipment was very expensive and it was hard to kind of start up in this career on your own. And this was particularly important and beneficial for women artists. So the key artists associated with Antour Glenna are Wilhelmina Geddes, Catherine O'Brien, Evie Hone and Ethel Rind. Um, but there were other artists who also worked at the studio even though they weren't members of the cooperative. Uh, Beatrice Elvery, notably, and um, Kathleen Quigley, who uh, worked with both Harry Clark and Antoine Glenna. Um, so there were a number of uh, women artists, and women artists were in the majority, um, which was quite unusual. Um, Sarah Purser herself, of course, was a really important figure in the studio as the founder and, you know, the funder in the early days. She financed the studio, um, but she wasn't a stained glass artist. Um, in the strictest sense, she hadn't received formal training. She only completed one window entirely herself. Um, so most of her designs were executed by other artists in the studio, trained stained glass artists. And um, as more artists joined the studio, she kind of stepped back from the artistic side of things and really focused more on the kind of business and management of the studio. But she was really, um, she contributed so much to Antorica and particularly her social connections were so important for, um, for uh, securing commissions, both in Ireland and internationally. Um, so the next uh, uh, part of the exhibition looks at the creative rivalries um, because there were some Irish stained glass studios that were established in the 19th century. The key, the three key studios being Early and Co, which was the largest studio in Ireland. There's a photograph here um, from uh, the workshop at the Early's in 1901. And you can see it's all men working there. Um, there was Watson and Co, a cork based studio, and then Clark Studios. Um, Watson was, um, James Watson, uh, came to Ireland, he was an English artist. He came to Ireland to work at the Yaw branch of English church decorators, Cox, Sons, Buckley and Co. You can see an advertisement for this, um, this uh, um, court branch uh, on the left uh, where it, it's, it states, um, encourage Irish art and industry. And the advertisement is quite wordy, but you can see they also emphasize that their stained glass is made using Irish leads. Um, Watson, uh, James Watson bought out the studio in uh, 1894 and established James Watson and Co, which was also known as the Artworks. And we have some examples of their designs here. Um, Watsons were um, active until they, they were, they remained um, in operation right up until 2012. Uh, so we have a huge archive of theirs. Um, in our in our archives and um, was actually transferred from the Crawford Art Gallery. Um, so these are watercolor designs um, are examples of uh, Watson's um, kind of uh, repertoire. Um, you can notice that the one on the left, um, Christ uh, the light, as the light of the world, that there are numerous inscriptions uh, from various clients who have approved this um, design. So all of the artists that Antoine Glenn and other studios would have sent out these watercolor designs, quite small sketch designs to their clients and the clients would approve them or uh, suggest changes. Um, here uh, you can see that um, numerous uh, churches have approved this design and that would have been the norm in most um, studios but it wasn't the norm in Antorglin. Antorglin really emphasized um, the idea that they would make new designs for every commission. Um, you can see the traditional uh, gothic canopy on the design on the left whereas on the right we see the incorporation of this lovely intricate uh, Celtic ornament um, and this was something I mentioned that all of the different studios were getting behind as part of the Celtic revival and um, Watson were particularly talented at, at making these 
really beautiful um, Celtic ornamental borders. And it was something that was kind of a hallmark of their studio that they were quite famous for. Um, they they won they they won international they won national awards I should say Irish awards in Irish competitions for the same glass they did exhibit at the St Louis World Fair so they were you know at competitors with Antoine Glenna um, but um, the you know there is a, you know fine craftsmanship high quality materials some very finely painted details the faces and um, the ornament the Celtic borders. But there, there was a kind of a traditional division of labor here with the master painting the faces, the apprentice painting the robes. And so there's this underlying kind of uniformity that contrasts with the rich variety and individuality of Antorglena's designs. Um, so the, the chief rival for Antorglena was Harry Clark Studios, of course, Clark Studios. Um, these are some advertisements from our archive which show the dramatic evolution of Clark Studios from Joshua Clark's and um, quite, you know, boring designs on the left um, to Harry Clark's extraordinary original um, stained glass windows. Um, Harry Clark really made his reputation um, in 1916 with his Hone and Chapel um, stained glass designs. And um, Sarah Purser, I think, was expecting to get the full commission for Hone and Chapel in the end. Harry got 11 windows and Antorglena got eight. So she was no doubt disappointed by this development. Um, and we get a sense of their kind of rivalry or jealousy perhaps from Purser here in this letter, uh, writing to Mary Swansea about the Dublin Painters Exhibition in 1923. She writes, Harry Clark, as usual, all dots and circles. Uh, so she's pretty dismissive. Um, now, uh, I suppose um, with Harry Clark, he is a kind of the acknowledged leader of on, uh, of the um, Irish arts and crafts or the Irish stained glass movement in the early 20th century. Um, and what this exhibition wants to really uh, emphasize is the individuality of Antwerglin's design. So with Harry Clark, under his supervision, um, Clark Studios was producing stained glass in one very specific design style which he had developed. And after his untimely death, uh, the studio continued to emulate this uh, one specific kind of house style. So he was very interested in the arts and crafts movement, um, but he wasn't building a studio from the ground up. He was taking over an existing studio, his father's studio, which already had a traditional kind of working method in place. And after his death, as I said, they employed a chief, uh, kind of a principal designer who was tasked with, um, I guess, uh, at delivering a studio style that was very much derived from Harry Clark's um, uh, design aesthetic. So there was very little scope for experimentation and artists like Richard King really had to leave on tour, or leave Harry Clark's studios before they could develop their own personal style. And the opposite is the case at Antour Glenna. Um, we consistently, consistently see the artists bring their own um, creative um, style, individual tech, techniques to uh, their designs um, you know here we have two different very different uh, representations of Saint Brendan with Wilhelmina Geddes you have again this as I mentioned before you've got this strong bold graphic treatment of the uh, the saint there's this wonderful kind of psychological emotional intensity to his expression and um, with Michael Healy it's quite a delicate draftsmanship um, the design is really imbued with his kind of spiritual uh, sincerity, which, um, you know, um, reflects his own personal strong faith. Similarly, uh, we have Catherine O'Brien and St. Patrick here, a, a really lovely kind of, um, uh, um, I suppose, gentle, um, reverent depiction of the saint. There's quite a humane kind of treatment of the figure. He's quite, it's, it feels like quite an accessible design. It's, it's, there's a lovely kind of folk quality to it. Whereas with Michael Healy, um, there's quite a strong sense of gravitas. Um, it's more imposing St. Patrick here. And there's this beautiful exquisite detailing as well that he brings in to his designs. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll jump into some of the key artists. Um, Michael Healy, um, he, uh, he um, was born in Dublin and he had a very different background from most of the artists at Antorgana who came from, you know, comfortable Anglo-Irish, uh, usually Protestant backgrounds. Healy was born in a, um, a Dublin tenement 
and he began working um, at 14. And when he started uh, um, studying art, he was also working part time as a sugar boiler. He was sponsored to study life drawing at the Academy di Belle Arti in Florence. Um, and this kind of classical, this training in the classical tradition is evident in his, particularly in his early designs. We have Saint Simeon here, which is for the first ever design he made for Antwerp Vienna. Um, and the detail particularly of the young uh, St. John the Baptist in, at the base of the design is very, very much shows a strong debt to the Italian Renaissance masters like um, Raphael and uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, so uh, uh, in the archive, we have the workbooks which record every order made, um, or at least most of the orders made, um, uh, and it can look like a bit of a mess when you're looking at it first, but there actually is quite in interesting information often um, uh, included here. So this design uh, took 260 hours for Healy to make, and he was paid eight pence an hour for it. Um, it was uh, the 15th design for, uh, commission, sorry, it was the 15th commission made of Antwerglina, uh, and it came from Lockray uh, Cathedral for Lockray Baptistry. So again, I mentioned the importance of Lockray Cathedral uh, in terms of early support for the studio. Um, it was a companion piece to accompany Sarah, Sarah Purser's design for St. Eta. And you'll see that both of these designs, or both of these stained glass panels were sent to St. Louis World Fair in 1904 before they were installed in the Galway Cathedral. Um, there was also um, a model uh, uh, hired by the studio for uh, the design of this um, window. So again, the importance of Healy uh, of drawing from life in its early designs. And you do get a sense here, um, beautiful draftsmanship, but you do get a sense that the, the lead lines are almost an afterthought that are added on rather than kind of a fundamental um, part of the composition. Over time, he really, um, he really uh, uh, embraces the innate qualities of stained glass and really tries to exploit the full potential of this medium, which is different from all other mediums, of course. Um, in this design on the left, uh, you can see that um, the, there's the beautiful kind of iridescent uh, detailing, um, particularly the, the wings and, and clothes of the angels, um, which reveal uh, Healy's intentions to uh, use um, flash glass and a labor intensive acid etching technique to um, create this sparkling jewel like effect. And this technique, of course, is the very technique that um, Harry Clark popularized just a year or two later um, for his from kind of his home and chapel designs. Um, but he kind of got in there first, even though he is overlooked. Um, and you can see that in um, this article from 1926 in the Irish Statesman which writes that Mr. Healy amazed us all by pushing the acidity of glass, a well-known process, to an extreme which makes almost a new departure and so greatly enhances modern art, and of which of late Mr. Clark and his pupils have made so popular. So Healy was quite pioneering in his um, stained glass techniques. Um, uh, I'll keep moving forward. Um, Oh yeah, just to note as well that this uh, this comp this composition, this design was originally used in the tracery of his um, of his Donnybrook uh, stained glass window, and he used it again for this smaller panel. He exhibited it in Paris in the 1922 Irish Race Congress exhibition, and it was bought in 1925 by an American uh, stained glass artist, Charles Connick, who uh, brought it back to America, and it's now in Michigan in the Cranbrook Academy. Healy made a lot of, in his spare time, he made a lot of these um, watercolour uh, kind of drawings and sketches of um, people going about their business from all walks of life in, on the streets of Dublin. So this is very much his hobby, but it really influenced his secular designs. As you can see here, this is a design for um, an opus secta mosaic for uh, the Old Vic Theatre in London. Unfortunately, it was never, um, it was never um, executed, but um, it's an interesting insight into Healy secular practice. Um, and Obiseto was a kind of a sideline for Antwerp using um, kind of large sheets of glass that would be set into um, concrete frames on the walls. 
Um, Ethel Ryan was particularly noted for this um, technique. Um, the uh, panel Ifanito uh, is borrowed from the model Sligo for our exhibition at the gallery. Um, again, it takes inspiration from his sketches of um, different scenes and people that he observed around Dublin. Um, the title in Italian means it's finished, so it's like the end of the day, the end of the day's work. We see the kind of sleeping cabman, uh, sleeping cabman on the uh, the uh, horse enjoying his uh, dinner. Um, and uh, it was it, 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 um, it was interesting as well because he uh, Billy's grandfather was um, a cab owner, so it has maybe a, perhaps a personal um, uh, interest to him this subject matter. The Renaissance was an enduring source of inspiration for Healy. Um, the influence of uh, Fra Angelico's San Marco, the composition uh, very clearly referenced in his design for Blackrock College Chapel. This particular commission was um, actually commissioned by John McQuaid when he was president of um, Blackrock College. Uh, and this was in the late 1930s, so around the time he was um, advising De Valera on the constitution. It's kind of interesting as well. The next artist, Wilhelmina Geddes, was born in um, Leitrim, but is most closely associated with, in Be with Belfast. She always considered herself to be a Belfast woman. It was where she was raised and where she trained as an artist. And she was still studying at the Belfast School of Art when uh, Sarah Purser um, purchased her striking illustration, Cinderella Dressing Her Ugly Sister. Uh, this one isn't actually in the exhibition. I just wanted to show it to you. Uh, Purser was completely enchanted by this. Uh, design this illustration and she invited Geddes to join on Port Lina, um, which Geddes did in 1912. Um, and she went on study trips with Purser and Catherine O'Brien to look at French uh, stained glass. And that proved to be a really important source of inspiration for Geddes throughout her career. Um, Geddes Ulster Connections brought new commissions to the studio. So this was the design uh, for St. John's Church in Belfast. Um, uh, unlike um, her colleagues, Catherine O'Brien, Michael Healy, who were quite, had quite a strong personal faith. Um, Geddes wasn't particularly religious, and I often think she brings sort of a secular quality to her uh, stained glass designs. Um, so this is a depiction of paradise, and we have gorgeous details, the fruit trees, this kind of um, stream running through the bottom of the, comp the bottom half of the composition. You've got the angel um, sitting in a a uh, pine tree at the top, and then these different groups of people, um, ladies and sages and poets and saints. You've got Saint Brendan there, um, uh, with or um, in the mix. Um, it's a really interesting kind of stylized, flattened composition. Um, recalls, you know, the uh, developments of Cubism in Europe around this time as well. And um, it's a really in, in original design. And it was a war memorial. Uh, um, so at this time in the aftermath of the First World War, um, the studio ironically received a huge amount of uh, war memorial commissions that kept the studio very busy and very profitable um, in the early uh, and mid 1920s, because of course many lives have been tragic tragically lost in the First World War. Um, a major war memorial commission that Wilhelmina Geddes um, carried out was this. Um, huge uh, three light window for a church in Ottawa commissioned by the Duke of Connacht for his um, to commemorate 10 uh, officers from his Canadian staff who were killed during the uh, First World War and um, Geddes produced about five different versions of this in her preparatory designs and apparently she was um, she was uh, um, advised by William Orpin on the composition and Sarah Purser as well um, it dates from about 1917. I think the window was completed in 1919. So it was a, it was actually one of the most, kind of the first um, international commission that really brought international uh, uh, attention and recognition to Antwerp. So Geddes played a really important role in this respect. Um, so uh, I'll keep moving. Um, this is one of the stained glass panels in the exhibition by uh, Wilhelmina Geddes. Rhoda opens the door to St. Peter, which we borrowed from the Ulster Museum. Um, I particularly love the detail of Rhoda's dang jangling keys there, catching the light and her pink headscarf. Um, interesting to see the different treatment um, 
Rhoda has this kind of stylized uh, treatment, uh, flattened kind of effect, um, inspired by uh, the Greek collection of that is admired at the British Museum. And then uh, St. Peter, of course, is this kind of strong, robust uh, character with his like brooding facial expression, strong gestures. So there's a very different uh, treatment to the, to the two figures, but they're sort of unified by the, the light emanating from uh, Rhoda's um, candle and uh, St. Peter's um, halo. And this was actually originally designed as a, an embroidery panel, which uh, Geddes later adapted it to this wonderful stained glass um, piece. He uh, suffered from ill health and frequently retreated to Belfast to uh, do her, um, to complete her designs for the studio. And ultimately she moved to London in 1925 and embarked on a really successful um, solo career in London, uh, working at the Glass House. But she remained in contact with Antoine Glynna and she produced these gorgeous and um, beautiful uh, illustrations for the 25th anniversary celebration booklet uh, produced uh, um, in 1928. I particularly love the detail of the this androgynous figure blowing uh, glass bubbles, one for each year in which the studio was in operation. And you can see each of the dates there if you look closely at the larger bubbles. Um, the kind of scroll at the bottom is um, it's a an adaptation or a variation on uh, a quote from Shakespeare's Cleopatra, Anthony and Cleopatra, um, age cannot wither, nor custom style, their infinite variety. I think this infinite the idea of infinite variety really helps to convey the diversity of um, the studio's output, which hopefully you're all getting a sense of at this stage. So uh, next up is Catherine or Kitty O'Brien. Uh, she was the second artist invited to join the studio by Sarah Purser in 1903. And her early works really show the influence of um, of um, uh, the English arts and crafts style and um, the um, instructions and mentorship of her teacher, A.E. Child. So you can see particularly in her design for St. Nighy's Church there on the left, again, you have these warm mellow colours, these um, uh, pale diamond shaped quarries in the background, and of course the uh, leafy canopy. Um, the design on the right is for one of the studio's most lucrative um, commissions for a um, Chinese millionaire living in Singapore and um, who commissioned uh, stained glass for his own house and for his son's house in Singapore. Um, and this uh, design is for the spirit of the night, so an allegorical uh, secular uh, stained glass panel. Um, and today uh, this panel is located in um, the Colonial Museum in Penang. Um, uh, Catherine O'Brien was particularly admired for her, um, she excelled in these kind of uh, smaller scale depictions of Irish saints, again, we've got that lovely kind of reverent, humane um, depictions of the saints, um, which we've seen with St. Patrick, um, St. Cullum Killa on the right is um, obviously dates from many years later, 1952, again, we've got this gorgeous kind of glowing profusion of oranges, um, purples, reds, greens, and blues. So um, as, as time went on, uh, Catherine O'Brien embraced kind of really bright colors in her um, designs, but you still see, you know, the details of the Celtic revival, treatment of the name, the saint, and this kind of um, pale backdrop um, as well. Um, and uh, Catherine O'Brien, um, went on then in 1943, Sarah Person passed away and Catherine bought out the studio from the main artists, Evie Owen, Hubert McGoldrick, and um, I think it was just the three of them that were left at that stage. So she bought out the studio and continued to practice as a solo artist on the same site, the premises of Antorglina, um, for another nearly two decades. And she produced an um, uh, important stained glass for um, churches around Ireland and further afield in Florida um, and Kenya, for example. Um, a great picture of her with these uh, Stations of the Cross Randalls for St. Helens Church in Florida. Uh, she rented out studio space to another stained glass artist, Patrick Pollan. Um, and uh, after Catherine O'Brien passed away, um, Patrick Pollan bought out the studio and he donated the in archive um, to the National Gallery in 1966. Um, 
And this encompassed like the, as all the kind of material I've discussed, or most of the material I've discussed today in terms of the watercolors, the workbooks, the cat, uh, the cat books, photographs. Unfortunately, the cartoons, the full scale cartoons did not survive and um, they were destroyed in a um, studio fire in 1958. But thankfully, the gorgeous watercolors uh, were not destroyed in the fire, so they now reside in our collections in the gallery. Uh, finally, the last artist to join on Thor Glenna was Evie Hone, um, and I'll finish up now with Evie Hone. Um, so she uh, represented a completely new departure for in Thor Glenna. Um, because Evie Hone, of course, was trained in European modernism. She trained in Cubism in uh, France with um, André Lotte and Albert Glaze. Um, so she was um, like Healy, who was a good friend of hers. Um, she was a religious, very religious uh, woman. She converted to Catholicism. She um, felt that uh, stained glass, had, she had a natural affinity for this as a kind of, she felt it was a good fit for her career. So she approached Sarah Purser to join Anthorgan, but she was rejected as untrained. And she tried to, um, she, she took up lessons with A.E. Child, but really it was kind of mutually a disagreeable relationship. You know, Evie Hone was um, uh, in, you know, the 1930s, she was um, uh, steeped in, as I mentioned, European modernism. A.E. Child hadn't really changed his teaching methods or his, um, kind of uh, style of uh, stained glass. It was very much still um, working in the arts and crafts style that he had uh, begun teaching in 1903, like 30 years previously. So uh, Evie Hone left and instead trained with Wilhelmina Geddes in London. And she returned to uh, join on toward then in 1933. And she had no interest in the kind of um, acid etching, intricate um, kind of uh, detailing that we see that, you know, Michael Healy was doing. She was um, much more interested in kind of exploring the abstract potential of stained glass. We really see the um, impact of her training in cubism, particularly in her design for jugs, which we have on loan in the exhibition from, um, from uh, the Hugh Lane Gallery. And with Evie Hode, her work, you know, is is it can be seen as a synthesis of you know Irish monastic sculpture, medieval stained glass, and European modernist painting. She was very interested in the religious expressionism of George Rolt, for example. Um, and uh, this is another stained glass um, piece in our exhibition from our collections, Three Children in the Inferno. And the story goes, uh, it's from the Old Testament. Um, the 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 the, the the um, strong religious faith of these three children saved them from the fiery furnace. So it seemed kind of like an appropriate uh, one for Evie Hone, who herself um, had a strong faith. Um, so it's really interesting to see how the uh, styles evolve from A.E. Child right up to Evie Hone um, at, the, uh, at the end of the exhibition. So um, that kind of brings me to the end of the talk here. I just wanted to point out as well, a few resources which might be of interest if people want to find out more. Um, you're very welcome to have a look at our website, our, our archival website, the Library and Archive website, source nationalgallery.ie, and you can have a look at the Untordlin archive there. Um, I, Joanne may also mention we have some walking tours, guided walking tours, um, looking at some examples of Antorgan stained glass in our neighbourhood coming up as well. So uh, you might be interested in looking into that. We have a self-guided walking tour as well on source. Um, if you're interested in finding out how stained glass is made, I definitely recommend having a look at um, Hallowed Fire, The Art of Evie Home, which is available for free on the IFI website. Um, and it's just a 12 minute kind of documentary from the 1950s, but it really breaks down the process of making stained glass, which is explored in the exhibition as well. And finally, uh, the Gazetteer of Irish Stained Glass is a really interesting publication that um, records all of the Irish stained glass in every church and public building around Ireland. So if you're interested not to see in what's, what's uh, in your locality, um, it might be worth having a look at that as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. Thank you so much for that. I'll just put myself the same size. That gazetteer of stained glass sounds like a great thing to have in the car. 
That's exactly it. Yeah, <laughs> I really think nice. so. Any road trips. Yeah. yeah. Great for the glove compartment. Thank you so much, Mary. That was really, really interesting. And stained glass is such an incredible medium uh, because, of course, of those incredible bright colours and because although we have some pieces in our collection, many of the works are in buildings all over Ireland, but as you said, with this all over the world, which is quite remarkable. Mm. Um, you'll find anyone who's interested in doing those walking tours will find information on our website about those, um, but I imagine they'll book up quite fast. So get onto the site soon. Uh, now we've lots of questions coming in. Um, you mentioned earlier, uh, and I did too, that the, um, the, the selection will change. Uh, is there a way that you can let people know? Yvonne's wondering if you can let us know in the newsletter when it's being changed yeah. so people know. Absolutely. So we don't have dates set in stone yet, but it'll probably be around July and October that we do the, the switch. Um, and we will definitely be spreading the word, um, the newsletter, um, social media and on our website and everything. So we will get we will get the word out. So definitely keep, keep an ear open um, for that. Great. OK, looking forward to that. Lots of people saying thank you so much. It was a fascinating uh, talk and I have a couple of questions here. So Anne was saying that she sees from the purse or poster, uh, the one that you said she, yes. she, she got on trains and she was trying to find free something and um, that the, the word mosaic is used. And did the Torglina studio work with mosaics? And if so, where could we see them? And did purser liaise with any European mosaic artists? Do we know? That's a really interesting question. So I mentioned Opus Sectile, um, which was kind of the official name for this type of mosaic that um, Antorgina worked on. And it's it's different from the kind of small tessery kind of ones that you would see maybe in like okay. Pompeii. It's these larger kind of uh, pieces of glass that would be kind of stuck in together onto the concrete. So it is a very specific technique. Um, it was mostly... Uh, Can you spell that for us? Yeah, Sorry. Yes. Opus... Uh, Opus Secto, so it's O-P-U-S uh, space uh, S-E-C-T-I-L-E, -E. Okay. Opus Sectile. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, yeah, it was, it was a technique I think that was used in kind of ancient Rome and that I'm not sure if um, Purser uh, had connections with European Opus Sectile makers uh, but um, it was a kind of a sideline for Montori Glina and I think the best examples would be um, in a church in Spittle uh, I'm not exactly sure what the name of the church is but at the Rhine made at the Stations of the Cross uh, uh, in Opus Sectile quite famously. Okay. Church and spittle, so <laughs> right. I, you know, the people take part in these from all over the country. So somebody is probably there now and will be able to go <laughs> exactly. after lunch and check, uh, or if they're watching this video, whenever they can. Um, now, somebody else asked earlier, you'd said, um, I think it was about Sarah Purser that she designed but didn't execute. Does that mean a window wasn't completed? No, it means that, sorry, um, to explain that, it means that um, another artist executed the window. So mm -hmm. while Anthor Glenna, you know, um, was very conscious about their arts and crafts credentials, the idea that one artist was responsible for every step um, from, you know, designing to executing the window. There were occasions, particularly in the beginning when artists were training in this um, medium, where Sarah Purser would design the sketch and then maybe a child would draw the cartoon and maybe another artist would actually paint it. So um, particularly in the early days, you do see a bit of a division of labor there um, in practice. But uh, yes, it was only one, there's only one window that was fully executed by her, um, which is a small St. Brendan uh, window in the porch of Lockray Cathedral. But right. her other designs like the one in St. Patrick's Cathedral were executed by other artists. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, right. Sandra says she'd be down in Spiddle and is going to check it out. Uh, Patricia Sweet. and Brian have said Opus Sectile Stations of the Cross are in Lochray Cathedral. So there we're getting all this. In. This is great. And somebody else has said there's a Torglina Opus Sectile on the side of Grange Gorman Church in Dublin for anyone who's interested. So well, yeah, outsourcing Sweet. this information. It's fantastic. Somebody else has asked what was the name of the magazine we mentioned. So that's the Gazetteer of Irish Stained Glass. Yes. 
So it's actually um it's actually a book. Um I think it just came out in soft Sounds, copy. Yeah. It, it's available on our web on the NGI shop website. Um and it's it's just it has a lovely introduction to Irish stained glass and then it goes through every county in Ireland and it was all of the Irish uh, windows in churches and public buildings listed and the artists responsible. And it also has the international ones uh, for anyone who wants to look at Irish stained glass and uh, further afield. Fascinating. I must get one for the glove compartment. Um, somebody else has said, you mentioned the importance of the arts and crafts philosophies, including, of course, the valuing of individual craftsmanship. And was there a big threat of industrialization and mechanization in the field of stained glass? And, and could people buy cheaper off the rack windows, so to speak? Absolutely. Great yeah. That was what um, uh, Sarah Purser and Edward Martin and these figures were really trying to push back against because um, the windows that were coming into Ireland, there uh, often were these kind of mass produced designs. Um, uh, some of the big commercial firms, they really there wasn't much artistry involved. It was mm -hmm. more just kind of about profit. Um, so there definitely was a pushback against this kind of industrialization. And um, so the, the windows that are made in this way, they, there's just, they're quite insipid, the designs, the, the materials are quite poor quality. So um, this is exactly what Sarah Purser was seeking to um, uh, push back against when she founded Onto Work. And there was a lot of rhetoric kind of in the newspapers about this at the time, because people recognised that the church was um, a major potential patron for Irish artists. Great, that's really interesting. And speaking of materials, Sandra was wondering where were the Irish artists obtaining their glass? Um, mostly from uh, uh, companies in the UK. Um, I can't remember the <laughs> names. Um, <laughs> yes, exactly. So it was, it was, it was usually because um, uh, oh, there were specific, specific oh, types of glass um, that was, you know, kind of it was called antique glass and it was kind of hand blown glass. It was, um, uh, again, this kind of glass that had um, maybe uh, different flaws in the glass, which were actually like exploited by the artist to create kind of surface effects. Uh, so the materials were important. You kind of did have to get the right type of glass to make the right type of effects. Of course. Window. Yeah. OK, thanks for that. Sorry, there's a bit of noise in the background here in the office and everybody's in today because it's Wednesday and we're all here. Um, Mary's saying she really enjoyed hearing the source of the name on Tour Glynna. That It's that's quite mm -hmm. the story you have to tell to get to the name. Yeah. <laughs> um, but really interesting. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you. And Stephen Hughes, who's actually going to be doing these uh, tours with us, has commented that the walking tours, uh, that Hetley Wood and Chance Brothers were the main glass suppliers, he thinks. So thanks for that, Stephen. That's great. Um, final question from Seamus. He's wondering what the date of the ethyl rind stained glass is, if you have it. Um, now, is that the, the first one you showed? Yes. So unfortunately, I don't have a date for that. It's undated and I don't think it was executed. Uh, so I think those are the St. Bridget ones we're talking about. Uh, those ones were probably they might have just been kind of like her working out ideas. They might have been a design for um, maybe the predella of a window, kind of the narrative at the bottom of the composition. Or they could have been also, again, for an opus sectile design. So it's not fully clear. And I don't think it was ever actually executed. So unfortunately, I don't have a date for them. Um, so that one is a bit of a mystery. Yeah, That's OK. Um, Lucy has asked a couple of things. First, she's just saying thanks for a great talk and that she was more familiar with Harry Clark's work. But this has expanded her knowledge about other studios. And it's great to learn that there were so many female artists involved in this type of artistry. It really is absolutely wonderful. Um, and she was also wondering if it's possible to get a copy of the presentation. This this talk is recorded. We will be putting it on the gallery's YouTube page. So I will edit the subtitles so that they're not full of mistakes like the um, auto corrected ones are <laughs> on on this but uh, it'll take me a couple of days and it'll be up uh, probably late this week early next week and I'll email everybody who's booked a ticket for this whether they're here today or not um, so that they have that link uh, with them as well so we'll leave it there thank you so much Mary thank you very much Lisa for your work interpreting today as well uh, we hope that you all get an opportunity to come in and see this exhibition as we've said it's open for quite a long time relatively speaking but there'll be lots of changes in it during the course thank you so much Mary again I, I hope you enjoyed uh, working on this as much as we enjoyed hearing about it
Absolutely. Thanks, Joanne. Take care and have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.